last week, President Obama signed the FAA Modernization and Reform Act, also known as the FAA Reauthorization Act, into law. The media focused on blockbuster issues like labor rights and other provisions, but tucked away in that legislation was the requirement that will change how these aerial drones or unmanned aircraft systems are handled by the FAA. What essentially does it say? Well, what it, uh, what it essentially says is by September 2015, one of the provisions in there, and there are a number of provisions related to unmanned aircraft systems, but one of those is that by 2015, uh, we will provide for access to the NAS for these aircraft. Um, again, I think we have been working for a number of years with industry and are very close to being able to, to sometime this year, publish uh, rules that will allow the small unmanned aircraft to fly in the airspace, in our airspace, safely with other aircraft. Uh, we're continuing to work with them on standards for the larger unmanned aircraft, for them to be safe uh, in our airspace system, and, uh, and we're confident that by the 2015 deadline we'll be able to set those standards. Well, under the current rules, most commercial applications for these systems for so-called drones are either banned or highly regulated, but small unmanned aerial systems, also known as SUAs, are permitted as long as they're operated for non-profit purposes. What are the current regulations? Well, the current uh, regulations uh, are that you have to be able to meet the same uh, operating requirements as manned aircraft. We currently don't have a set of design standards for how you build these, uh, these vehicles. Many of them were built uh, by uh, companies that were supporting the Department of Defense. Uh, they were built to, uh, for, for a military environment. Uh, they were built for that mission and they performed uh, marvelously uh, for Department of Defense. They weren't necessarily built with the idea in mind that they would be operating in our national airspace system. Uh, you know, in the U.S., we have 100,000 uh, operations a day in instrument flight conditions. We have over 230,000 general aviation aircraft that could potentially be flying uh, on any given day. So we have a lot of traffic in the U.S., and they really weren't built to a standard that will allow them to fly uh, in, in an uh, unfettered way or without regulation in the U.S. Um, we've been able to let some operate because we work individually with the agencies that are, um, you know, that are requesting it to make sure that they put the right safety standards around that particular operation. But uh, we're close to, to being able to set standards so that these can fly uh, essentially like any other airplane. Well, this group has to adhere, it's my understanding, to two basic rules, stay under 400 feet and keep in eyesight. Why is that important? Well, the, uh, the requirement to stay under 400 feet for the small uh, aircraft as well as for the modelers uh, is to make sure that they don't conflict with our with our general aviation aircraft that are typically flying uh, 500 feet and above. So uh, the idea of having them in sight is so the operator can make sure that if there is other traffic that the operator can then uh, turn the small aircraft around and keep it clear and make sure there isn't a collision with it. Or if it has any problem, uh, the operator is then seeing the problem and can, can make sure it's safe and doesn't hit anybody on the ground. We're talking with John McGraw. He is Deputy Director, Flight Standards Service with the Federal Aviation Administration. If pilots are sitting in a cockpit, they can see if they're in the flight path of another vehicle and make quick adjustments. But with unmanned systems, it's not quite that simple. I've seen mention of sense and avoid capacity for these unmanned areas systems or drones. What does that mean? Well, the rules that are in place today that allow aircraft to operate depend on the pilot being able to look around and in fact we encourage them to look around to see if they see any other traffic or a bird or any other obstacle and avoid it. So that's the see and avoid regulation that's, that's in our operating rules. Uh, the unmanned aircraft obviously since they don't have a pilot on board, the pilot is remote, uh, isn't able to do that in the same way. Um, we're working with the industry to try to figure out a technological solution that allows them to sense and avoid rather than see and avoid other traffic to provide the same level of safety so that we can make sure they're just as safe uh, as other aircraft flying around. Five years ago, the FAA issued a notice that required special permitting to operate drones or as we've been calling them, as we've been calling these unmanned aerial vehicles. Many within the industry say that that notice effectively shut down the commercial drone industry and that it's effectively preventing a potential, potentially billion dollar industry from taking hold. Do you think that's fair? 
Uh, I don't think that's uh, uh, completely fair. I think as this technology has emerged, um, people were using these in a way that no aircraft had been used before. And so we were responsible to try to make sure they were operating it in a safe way. And to date, we haven't had anyone come forward and, uh, and apply and go through the process of certifying that the aircraft could be uh, certified like any other aircraft would be and operated in exactly the same way. The sense and avoid technology is one reason that they haven't done that yet. Um, we do think that with the rule that's coming out uh, sometime within the next year, it will help uh, enable that community to take advantage of this new technology uh, in a much bigger way. How do U.S. rules or rules in the U.S. differ from other countries? Well, there, there are two aspects to that. One is that we have more air traffic. We have more aircraft in the air than any other country around the world. And we are, um, we are providing broader access and easier access than almost any other country does. So we enable the, the flight of this technology more than any other country around the world. In doing research for this topic, we saw that many of the more innovative countries are in Europe and Australia, and in many cases, those companies and users credit laws that actually encouraged the development of the UAV industry. What do you know about that? Uh, there is uh, in some of those countries uh, where they have broad expanses of unpopulated areas uh, have encouraged the use in those areas. Um, we, we have a much more dense population and a, a lot more uh, air traffic that we have to make sure is safe. And so we, uh, you know, we have, as, as much as we can, enabled it uh, in areas where, uh, particularly where there's a low density of population. But certainly Australia is a unique case in where they have miles and miles of, uh, of remote territory with, uh, with essentially no people. As the agency moves to craft new, broader rules, do you anticipate rules that differentiate between for-profit companies and non-profit or recreational users? Yes, our approach would be that the uh, that for-profit would uh, have a different level of safety, a different expectation, uh, a, a more stringent set of requirements uh, as as other in other aviation. Uh, other aircraft that are commercially operated have a have a different level of safety and a different expectation from the public, uh, and also probably will want to fly in a different area than the not-for-profit, the, the modelers and the hobbyists would want to fly. So again, our focus on is on making sure that operation is safe. Will that be under the new rule you're talking about? That would be under the new rule we're talking about, yes. Does it also make sense to differentiate based on the weight of a drone system between a vehicle that weighs less than four pounds and heavier ones that might present a clearer safety challenge? It does, and uh, and and we are we are looking at it that way. Certainly, the the larger aircraft that are gonna, that are going to operate at higher altitudes typically uh, uh, can create more of a hazard than the smaller ones. So we are looking at it in terms of what hazard that each of these could present to someone on the ground or another aircraft, and we're going to make sure that those are safe. The new FAA reauthorization carved out an, ex an, an exemption of sorts for recreational hobbyists who actually find themselves in a kind of strange spot on this issue. From what I've been reading, many of them are unhappy that these new unmanned aerial vehicles could end up leading to more stringent rules on them. What does the RC, the remote uh, control community, f uh, feel about this? How do they fit into it? Well, I think they've enjoyed uh, a, a great uh, hobby uh, for, for many years without any competition. Certainly, adding more aircraft to the same airspace creates some pressure to, to make sure that, uh, you know, that they're all operated safely. Um, they, the, the modeling community has been very good at coming up with standards that allow them to operate safely. Uh, they have a good record, and they believe they have done a good job of that, and we agree. Um, we just want that to continue in the current environment where we have a lot of other aircraft coming into the same airspace. Under the current rules, prospective drone operators need to apply for permits from the FAA, and that applies to both civilians and law enforcement. What is a certificate of authorization for an unmanned aerial vehicle, and how long does that uh, process typically take? Well, it, it varies. Uh, depending on what the, the government agency wants to do with the vehicle, uh, the certificate of authorization allows them to apply and, and defines the set of limitations 
that allows their operation to be safe. So it prescribes what kind of training the pilots would need, what area they're going to operate in, what aircraft they're operating, um, what, they're, what they do in the event of any kind of an emergency or malfunction. So it puts a very detailed set of requirements on the operation to make sure that no one on the ground or in the air is, is uh, put at, at the, in jeopardy uh, during their operation. Once they've described that to us, uh, then, then we give them the authorization to operate. In some cases, it takes months and months and potentially even a year. Uh, we have uh, worked over the past two years to really streamline the process, and now the average is down to 30 to 60 days, uh, somewhere in that time frame. Uh, part of that is because the operators now understand what's, what is needed to be safe. This is an emerging technology, and so uh, they're learning as we're learning, and, uh, and it's becoming easier for them to apply once they've gone through this once or twice. Well, a number of civil liberties groups have raised privacy concerns about this, and I know that the FAA has been sued for information about some of that data. You cannot talk about that specifically, but can you tell us how the permitting differs for private versus, oh, official permission for, say, police departments and the like? Well, sure, uh, I, and, and uh, that's an issue that we're, uh, as this emerges and gets bigger and there are more and more of these that we know we're going to have to, to, to work through. Um, the the um, uh, private entities can, uh, can apply for an experimental airworthiness certificate. So that's kind of a technical term for the ability for a private entity to fly one of these. It's essentially a very similar set of operating uh, requirements that we have under a COA or a certificate of authorization or waiver. So the two are very similar in terms of providing the same level of safety. One, though, is for a civilian operator to ask us for approval to fly, and the other is for government entities to apply. Well, you know, we talked about vast open spaces in places like Australia, but the Washington area is unique in that its security concerns have to do with both federal and local concerns. We're a fairly congested area. Would the rules for Washington, D.C., especially uh, since you happen to be a pilot and you know this area very well, yep. would the rules for the Washington area probably be different from most of the rest of the country? Well, the, the Washington, uh, certainly New York, a lot of the more population-dense areas in the country um, are, would require a different set of, of uh, mitigations in place to make sure the operation could be safe. So uh, I, I don't think Washington is uh, that much more unique than some of the other really well, dense built-up Well, my backyard areas. is probably no more than about a mile away from the White House, probably a mile and a half away from the Capitol, the Supreme Court. I suspect that that has to right. be taken into consideration. It does. And, and, of course, those security concerns apply to any aircraft that's flying. We, we have prohibited areas around uh, and and a lot of control around how any aircraft flies. So that's really not a unique thing for unmanned aircraft, although we might uh, have some additional mitigations we would have to put in place for them uh, just to make sure that they stay contained within the, the airspace they're supposed to stay in.